Hi, welcome to uh, the first edition of lionfishhunter.com. Uh, today we are interviewing Alan Inlow, who was an importer of South Pacific tropical fish for 20 years. And he spent two years as a senior biologist for a major public aquarium chain. Uh, now, Alan, tell us a little bit about your experience with this um, this aquarium uh, chain that you work for. Well, well, I was the actually first employee that Ripley's Aquarium hired, and my duties consisted of uh, collection and husbandry and stocking of their aquariums that they've been building around the world recently. Uh, I spent quite a bit of my time uh, offshore and in the South Pacific itself in the collection of species of fish that uh, are normally kept in saltwater type aquariums. The more exotic the better. And uh, quite a few of them were the lionfish. We spent quite a bit of our time in the pursuit of lionfish because of their popularity in the ornamental fish industry. And because of their high cost, it was cheaper for us to collect them than it was to buy them you know, off the American market. Tell me a little bit more about um, this hands-on experience you had where you actually gathered the fish. You yourself went down with the, uh, with the lionfish hunters and gathered the fish. What are the techniques that you used? Well, most of the time what we would do is the night before we would set out uh, clear containers, normally like five gallon water jugs full of the uh, shiniest bait fish we could find. Mm -hmm. And they would be ventilated, of course, to allow circulation inside them to keep the fish active and alive. And then in early morning, as the sun came up, we would find that the lionfish would all congregate from the nearby reefs trying to eat these fish. So then it was a matter of simply just going down and snatching them up with hand nets and then transferring them to the holding facilities on the, on the boat. It was really quite easy to collect them. It was one of the easier species to catch. So I guess rather than uh, I guess that would be a better technique than to go from reef to reef and search for the fish is to just have all the fish come to a centralized area where you have put this uh, bait bucket or what, whatever. Yeah, by all means, these fish had been hunted in this area pretty extensively for 50 years or so for the ornamental fish trade, so they weren't very plentiful, but this technique seemed to draw, you know, a dozen or so at least to each uh, food jug at each, each setting. So it made our collection tech, our collection efforts much easier. So instead of spending you know seven days on some island in the middle of the Philippines, we would only have to spend maybe two or three days there to get our quota and then you know ship them home. Right. That sounds very efficient. Um, um, what other question? Oh, when I think of when you're saying you used a clear bottle or whatever to to put the bait fish in. Was that like a what what we see now as a five gallon jug, those blue five gallon jugs, or was it something clear? Well, it was normally clear. The ones that we had access to were actually made out of glass, or else the ones that were made out of clear plastic. Now, anything clear that could hold the bait fish that you could weight down in a certain area that they could see be seen through right. would draw the fish in. Like a large pickle jar, or I'm trying to think of other other things that could be used yeah, for that. Yeah, anything as long as it had ventilation to keep the bait, the bait fish alive in it would work. What we have in the Bahamas is a fish called the pilchard, and they are about they're about yay big, and they're very very shiny. Perfect. And uh, we catch them with cast nets, so Perfect. that would be a good bait. That would, or plankton, or shrimps of any kind, anything like that that the lionfish can actually see move. The more movement, the better. Right. Um, what was the? What did they eat? What was their? Ba what was their natural food source? Lionfish, unfortunately, are undiscriminate predators. They eat anything that moves that they can fit in their mouth, and they can get things in their mouth about the same length as their own body. So they aren't limited to what they can eat except by their own size. I've seen five inch bodied lionfish eat five inch, you know, baby snappers. Unbelievable. That's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, from your opinion, it's a, it's a non-indigenous species introduced to the Caribbean reefs. What do you see five years from now or ten years from now if this problem goes un- uh, Unresolved. Just complete decimation of the reefs. I dove Eleuthera extensively in the early and mid 90s and didn't see a single lionfish. Never even saw, even heard of the lionfish down there. Uh, they're even uh, having reports of them uh, invading uh, the fishery as far north as we are here in Myrtle Beach now. And I'm sure that, you know, uh, that it's going to affect the, the, the fisheries as a whole all up and down the coast. Um, Alan, how, how do you conclude um, that, that the lionfish will 
decimate the reefs in the next five or ten years? Well, mainly the reason is that they have no natural predator to keep them in check. They're also indiscriminate feeders. They eat anything that moves, whether it be a crab or a shrimp or a fish. They can eat such large things, which also is quite surprising. In captivity, I've even witnessed them filling their bellies to the point of almost busting, then regurgitating the food that they've taken in, and then go back and taking in new fresh kill food, just kind of like a gluttonous binge of food. I've watched them in the wild and both in captivity swimming around with the tail hanging out of their mouth three inches while they sit there and digested the food till they could finally pack him into their gullet. Uh, the decimation of the reefs not only going to occur because of them eating the animals that are on the reef, the, 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 the fish so to speak, but the invertebrates and uh, other things that a reef depends on for life. Um, you know, whether it be the photosynthetic corals are going to be damaged because of the, the snails and the crabs that keep them algae free are going to disappear, or whatever, it's going to have a chain effect on it. If we don't get involved as humans, the reef isn't going to stand much of a chance because we're the ones that have caused this dilemma to start with. Whether it's been escaped from the aquarium industry, whether it's an escape from a ship ballast, it really doesn't matter. It's occurring right now. It's time to do something about it. Every hour we wait, and I mean honestly by the hour it is changing. We have to do something now or it will be too late. It's going to mean the loss of the seafood industry as far north as Maine and possibly the whole Atlantic Ocean. Well Alan, thank you so very much for thank coming you. on lionfishhunter.com Thank you too. And, uh, we hope to hear from you again in the future and maybe we'll make an expedition together down in Eleuthera and uh, educate some people down there. Okay, sounds very good. All right, thanks for tuning in to lionfishhunter.com. And uh, our next episode, we're going to go to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association in Beaufort, North Carolina, do some interviews there, and I hope you join us for that.